following is a Worldwide Church of God presentation. In August 1914, Europe erupted in war. For four terrible years, the great powers battled each other until they reached a standstill in the fields of France and Belgium. When the conflict was over and the armistice signed, a generation of young men had been slaughtered. The world was sobered. Weapons had become so powerful, the destruction so complete, surely civilization could not survive another war like this. This had to be the war to end all wars. Following the armistice, King Albert I of Belgium visited a battlefield in his shattered kingdom. Appalled by the scenes of ruin and slaughter, the king ordered an iron shell casing found on the battlefield to be cast into four watch cases. He intended to present the watches to the four individuals who he felt had made the most significant contribution to peace. One watch went to Field Marshal Ferdinand Foch, head of the Allied Supreme Command. Another was given to General John J. Pershing, Commander-in-Chief of the American Expeditionary Force. The third watch was presented to France's Premier, Georges Clemenceau, for his inspiring leadership in the dark days of war. But King Albert did not find anyone qualified to receive the fourth watch. When King Albert died, it was passed on to his son, King Leopold III. In 1970, half a century after the end of World War I, King Leopold presented this fourth watch to Herbert W. Armstrong. In accepting it, Mr. Armstrong said, I feel it was the highest honor the king could have paid anyone. Whatever contribution to world peace I may be making is not through war, but through education, teaching millions worldwide the way to peace. The 20th century has been a time of paradox, the most progressive and yet the most destructive decades in all history. Great advances have been made in science, engineering, architecture, medicine. Knowledge has exploded in nearly every field of human endeavor. And yet mankind is still losing the battle against the age-old curses of poverty, ignorance, superstition, and war. A few men have cavorted in triumph in the dust of the moon, but millions still languish in despair in the dust of the earth. Even as we forge ahead with brilliant progress and incredible inventions, we edge ever closer to a disaster which would make the earth once more without form and boy, is this how it will end, this century of great advancement? And now the weapons exist for the first time in all history when they can snuff out every life of every man, woman, and child on this earth. They can just blast all humanity off the earth until not one of us would be left alive. If some idiot, and he would be an idiot, sets off the nuclear explosion, 
And today, you know that several nations, several smaller nations, have nuclear weapons. And they could start, start it, and it would go to Russia and the United States and the big nations. And finally, there wouldn't be any humanity left. Most of us are asleep, and we don't realize what's going on all over the world. I am a voice crying out in the wilderness, the Babylon of religious confusion, of educational chaos and materialism, of political confusion and trouble in the governments of the world, all arming to have war and more war in a society that is bankrupt, in an economic system that is bankrupt, in that kind of a system. And I'm here to bring you the truth. So I ask you to open your ears and to listen, because you don't hear this from any other voice. Why do we have these Herbert Armstrong has been a voice of sanity in these decades of confusion. He has traveled the world, meeting heads of state of many nations. He has met the only two ruling emperors since the end of World War I, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia and Emperor Hirohito of Japan. He has also met with presidents and prime ministers of many nations the United Kingdom, Kenya, India, Israel, the Philippines, and Indonesia. He has also met all seven prime ministers of Japan since 1970. Mr. Armstrong explains the true cause of mankind's trouble. Why, in spite of the great progress in physical knowledge, the nations of the world cannot find the way to lasting peace. I've been coming to Japan <clears throat> now for many years. I'm a little hoarse tonight. You'll have to excuse me. I was speaking quite a while last night to many readers of our magazine, The Plain Truth. And I find that I'm a little hoarse. But as I was telling them last night, I have seen so many things happen in this world in the almost 90 years that I have lived. I have seen miraculous things happen. I have seen awesome progress. But also, I have seen appalling troubles and evils happening in the world, and it is becoming worse all the time. I have to ask why. Why the paradox of awesome progress and awesome accomplishments, sending men to the moon and back, jet plane travel, the miracle of television, the many things that we have today, and still so many troubles and so much sorrow and sickness all over the world. Mr. Armstrong has carried a message of warning and of hope to leaders in every corner of the world. His relentless efforts to explain the true meaning behind world conditions have earned him the title Unofficial Ambassador for World Peace. In the remote Himalayan kingdom of Nepal, two great Eastern religions coexist. It is the only Hindu kingdom in the world as well as the birthplace of Buddhism. In the Kathmandu Valley, hundreds of gods are an age-old testimony to the dominant role religion plays in the people's way of life. It has given me a great honor and privilege to introduce such a great man who is visiting our country. A person like Mr. Herbert 
W. Armstrong. This gentleman, for a moment all his life, has one ambition and one thought, and that is peace in the world. There should be peace, no war. They've called me an unofficial ambassador for world peace, and so I am. But let me say that there has to be a reason why we don't have peace. And you cannot have peace until there is something that will cause that peace. And there has to be a reason why something has caused us to have just the opposite of peace in this world today. And I'm afraid so many don't understand that. Now, in the world today, there are many different ideologies and philosophies and religions, and everybody seems to think that their own, of course, is the right one and the only one that is true and correct. And I did not come to bring any religion or philosophy or ideology, but just to state a few facts that are facts. We do not have peace and will not have peace until human nature has been changed. Herbert W. Armstrong is able to survey the 20th century from a unique perspective. In his long life, he has seen the coming of the inventions that have made possible the modern age, the airplane, radio and television, the computer, space travel, inventions that have changed our world, but not our thinking. In his lifetime, there have been two major attempts by the nations to bring about world peace. After World War I, the victors formed the League of Nations. Hopes were high that the world's governments could now act collectively to prevent war. But the League failed. It was unable to restrain the aggression by the fascist dictators in the 1930s. In June 1945, Mr. Armstrong, as an accredited press representative, was present at the signing of the United Nations Charter at Herbst Theater in San Francisco. The United Nations was a sincere effort to preserve the peace by a world tired of war. But the nations have continued to fight, oblivious to the only way to halt the endless cycles of death and destruction. Now, I'm not going out to crusade and just stop all wars. I can't do that. I have enough sense to know that I can never do that. And there is no man on earth who can. It is only the great creator who can. And it's because we do not rely on the creator for the knowledge of how to live and how to do. And because we just look to ourselves that we find we're helpless before our problems. The world does not know how to live because it does not rely on the great creator that is above all the gods and above all that is worshipped, above all of the ideas of human beings. But most human beings know nothing of that God. I can just tell you that Mr. Armstrong is an ambassador from a kingdom that is not of this world, with a message about government, law, war and peace, and the plan of God. That plan and the course of events that have led to our dangerous modern world were outlined long ago in the much misunderstood prophecies of the Bible. Over 4,000 years ago, God made a promise to the faithful patriarch Abraham. Because Abraham had obeyed him, God would raise up from him a chosen people who would become a model nation. If they would be faithful and obey God, he would bless them above all the nations of the earth. 
God kept his promise. He brought the descendants of Abraham's grandson, Israel, out of slavery in Egypt and revealed to them a way of life, ten great commandments, and laws, statutes, and judgments that would allow them to live in peace and safety in the promised land. The chosen people rose to the peak of their power and influence in the days of King Solomon. But after his death, they split into two, a northern kingdom of Israel, dominated by the descendants of Israel's son Joseph, and the southern kingdom of Judah. And they forgot their God. The northern kingdom continued for two and a half centuries, sinking ever further into idolatry until in the 8th century B.C., God allowed his people to be conquered and taken into captivity by the armies of the Assyrian Empire. The southern kingdom struggled on for 120 more years. But eventually, ignoring the warnings of the great prophets, Judah suffered the same fate. In 585 B.C., Jerusalem fell to the Babylonian emperor Nebuchadnezzar, and the inhabitants of Judah were led into exile. Jerusalem was in ruin, and the promised land laid waste. It seemed as if the promise had been broken. But God had not forgotten his people or his plan. In Babylon, a young Jewish captive, Daniel, is summoned before Nebuchadnezzar to interpret a strange dream that had troubled the Babylonian emperor. You, O king, were watching, and behold, a great image. This great image, whose splendor was excellent, stood before you, and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Then Daniel explained the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You, O king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. You are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours. Then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it. So the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. In one startling prophecy, God had outlined the course of world events for thousands of years into the future. During the next few years, God continued to give Daniel details of the four great empires that would dominate history. After a startling dream, Daniel awoke to write down the frightening revelation. I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. 
and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. And suddenly, another beast, a second, like a bear. It was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings as a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring breaking its pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Daniel laid a foundation, but he was not given full understanding. That would not come until many centuries had passed, and the world was in the tumultuous age spoken of in prophecy as the time of the end. When that time came, God would raise up another servant who would take a message to all the world, a world on the brink of destruction. And God has sent me to the kings and to the tops of nations even. And this gospel of the kingdom is going to all the world. Now what is going to happen? The hydrogen bomb has come. And you will read back in Ezekiel, the sixth chapter, that all of the great cities are going to be leveled and destroyed. I'm telling you that a time more terrifying than anything that ever happened is soon going to happen in this world. It's time we wake up. It's time we get our eyes open. We have lost God. We've forgotten God, and God is going to step in. Satan is ruling this dark world, and it's an unhappy world. And God has sent me to preach this gospel. The other ministers, the other churches are not preaching that gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach about Christ, but they don't preach his message. They preach about the messenger, but they don't preach the messenger's message. They ask Christ, what will be the end of the world? The end of the world is when this gospel of the kingdom is preached, and you are seeing it. You're seeing me here. I'm preaching it. This work that has grown into international scope began in 1934. The thirties were difficult times. The United States and Europe were in the grip of the Great Depression. In Germany, a madman had begun to lead his nation down the road to ruin. In 1934, although most did not recognize it, the world was entering the time of the end. Far from the center of turmoil, in the quiet Willamette Valley of western Oregon, God was leading Herbert W. Armstrong to understand the significance of these times. In his autobiography, Mr. Armstrong tells how his eyes were opened to see that the prophecies of the Bible had an urgent message for the modern world. Herbert W. Armstrong was being prepared for a vitally important mission. When God uses human instruments to do his work, things start small. To begin with, there was just Mr. and Mrs. Armstrong and a group of humble co-workers. But God was beginning to lay the foundation for a powerful last witness to the nations of the world. Using the experience gained in business, Mr. Armstrong organized the work into a three-point plan. A weekly radio program, a monthly magazine, 
and a continuing series of personal lectures and campaigns. The World Tomorrow grew from one program on a 100-watt station to a radio and television program that is now heard and seen on hundreds of stations around the world. From an even humbler beginning, the plain truth has steadily increased in quality and circulation until today it reaches into nearly every country on earth in many languages with a readership of millions. The third part of the three-point plan also began small. Mr. Armstrong held meetings in rented halls in the towns and villages of the Willamette Valley. As the work grew, he planned campaigns in other parts of the United States and eventually overseas. But God had even bigger plans for this part of the three-point plan. The turning point came in 1968. As the world moved closer to its date with destiny, God thrust his servant into the international arena. Like so many other major advances in God's work, it began with a series of apparent coincidences. It will be 20 years this year that we have been associated with Herr and Frau Hennig. We got to know them years ago at Bonn because of a visit of Mr. Manescu, who was the foreign minister of Romania. And something very interesting developed later, and maybe Fahani would like to tell us that story. Yes, we were looking for a particular camera. I don't quite remember which type, but in any case, it wasn't available in Germany, and Mr. Schnee pointed out that maybe in Belgium or America. Anyway, we drove to Belgium because we had an acquaintance there who has a wholesale camera business and we asked him and he told us that he thought he could get this camera for us both we and Mr. Schnee wanted one and then we stayed on a while until we were able to get a camera and Herr Roland invited us to join him for a cup of coffee in his private apartment upstairs upon that occasion something very special happened maybe you would like to tell that Mr. Schnee. Yes. Herr Roland, during this visit, handed me a stack of photographs. And I was looking at these photographs, and as coincidence would have it, just before this, Dr. Hay had given me the job of looking for color pictures because the Plain Truth magazine had just gone to full color. And we were desperate to get all kinds of color pictures. So I thought, well, these pictures would be wonderful. There were so many really good shots from all over the world. And I said to Herr Roland when he came back into the room, we would certainly like to buy some of these pictures for our magazines. And he sort of smiled knowingly and shook his head. He said, no, he said, you won't be able to buy these pictures. And I said, well, why not? He said, well, these were taken by King Leopold of Belgium. And he said, one thing, a king could not get involved in a commercial venture, but secondly, he said, anyway, he uses all of his photos for his own publications. And I remember saying, well, I still mean what I say. We could use these pictures for our publications. And I had almost forgotten about the incident when about a week or ten days later, suddenly the telephone rang, and Herr Roland was on the other side, quite excited. Herr Schnee, Herr Schnee, I've just come from the king. And the king says that he wants to meet you and talk to you about his photographs. And he would be willing to sell them to Ambassador College. But he said, before you come, could you bring something over so that I could go to the king and explain to him what Ambassador College is, the Plain Truth magazine, and who this man Herbert Armstrong is? And I said, certainly, I'll come right over tomorrow. And when I went, this time I took the 1966 envoy with me. Now, this was in 1968. And the biggest envoy that had, had appeared to that time was this 1966 issue. And I took this envoy, 
and I went through it page by page with Herr Roland and described to him what Ambassador College is and the work of God and Mr. Armstrong and what our goals are, what we hope to accomplish and so on. And the next day, Herr Roland then went to the king and explained the envoy to him as good as he could after I had shown him the envoy. Then Herr Roland came back to me and Herr Roland said, after seeing the envoy, the king would rather meet Mr. Armstrong. <laughs> of course, my vanity wasn't hurt, except maybe a little. <laughs> but he said, King Leopold wants to meet the man that has raised up this fine college. And so I had a tiger by the tail now because I had not even told Mr. Armstrong anything of what had gone before. So I called him up. He happened to be in England at the time. And I remember my opening sentence was, I hope I haven't done anything wrong, Mr. Armstrong. And he said, oh, what have you been into now? And I said, well, Mr. Armstrong, we have an invitation for you to keep meet King Leopold. And then I went on to explain how it all came about. And he said, well, you haven't done anything wrong. But he said, I'm not sure I'm going to go. I'm going to look into it first. And then about a week later, he said, well, I've got all the facts and he said I've decided to go so you can tell King Leopold we would be happy to accept his invitation it was quite a thrill to go with Mr. Armstrong into the king's palace and to be received by his servants we were ushered into a waiting room and then within a few minutes we were brought into a large drawing room I remember the king sitting at a small coffee table with uh, a chairs of padded furniture, very elegant. The king motioned us to come near and greeted us, shook hands and asked us to sit down. And then quite a shock came because the opening sentence that the king spoke was, Mr. Armstrong, why have you come to see me? And I thought, well, Ghastly, doesn't he know he has invited him? What have I gotten Mr. Armstrong into? But uh, Mr. Armstrong, very calm and collected, just said, well, I understand that you've had a look at our 1966 envoy describing Ambassador College and that Herr Schnee has shown that we have an interest in your color photographs and that you have actually invited me to come here. And the king said, yes, that's right. And a few more sentences were exchanged and it seemed a very short while and the king said, well, let's go down to my hobby room and let's look at some of my favorite slides. And I remember he showed us about 125 color slides, again, from all over the world. And of course, Mr. Armstrong was really elated to think that we could have such photographs for the Plain Truth magazine. And it was soon after this first visit that Mr. Armstrong made to King Leopold that he was invited back again. And Herr Roland told us later that it was a rare thing that a guest would be invited on the second visit already to meet the family and to have dinner with the family. Finally, I remember King Leopold visiting our college in Bricket Wood in England and then later visiting the college at Pasadena and speaking to the student body. And of course, a very deep friendship developed. And then from there, the, uh, the King, King Leopold introduced Mr. Armstrong to other personages in high office. And Mr. Armstrong began visiting leaders all over the world. And it's so hard to believe now but you can see that God always provides the right people at the right time. Just because of a camera we needed, we went to Belgium and we met Herr Roland. And just because of this remark that I made about these photographs that Herr Roland handed me and because of the need of them for the Plain Truth magazine, we saw this whole thing develop into Mr. Armstrong going to leaders all over the world as an ambassador for world peace. 
Since that first meeting in 1968, God has brought Mr. Armstrong before many of the world's most powerful and influential men and women. The walls of Mr. Armstrong's study in Pasadena are lined with mementos of those visits, gifts from the leaders of great nations and small. Some are still in office. Others are no more. Victims of old age, of political intrigue, or sometimes the assassin's bullet. Sincere leaders like Anwar Sadat of Egypt, whose dreams of peace were ahead of the violent times in which he lived. Incidentally, Mr. President, I want to say one thing right straight from the heart. I respect and admire you more than I can tell you. Because you have risked everything in an effort for peace. And your heart has to be in it, and it has to be genuine. Thank you, sir. And not many will do that. I meet heads of state all over the world, but I have not known one that would risk what you did of acquiring the enmity of the Arab world in order to have peace. Now, that takes courage. And Thank you have it. Right. Thank you very much. Right. And I'm going to let the world know it, because I reach a part of the world. Very good. Very good. Less than a year later, Anwar el-Sadat lost his life for the peace he sought. Shortly after the assassination of President Sadat, Mr. Armstrong returned to Egypt. I was out to the, uh, the memorial yes, uh, yesterday where President Sadat lies buried. I did give a little salute, and I just said quietly, well, goodbye, my friend. But leadership must continue, and the reins of government were passed on to the new Egyptian president, Hosni Mubarak. During this trip, Mr. Armstrong met with the new leader of Egypt. Uh, I'm not in politics. I'm an observer. I just look on. I represent God, Allah, and all people. Not any one nation, not any one religion, not any one government. But I'm a friend of all, and I, I work for peace yes. among all nations. And that is a contribution to peace. And as I say, we are not going to be able to bring peace ourselves. It'll be brought to us. In the cause of world peace, no region of the world is more crucial than the Middle East. This is the arena in which the fate of civilization will one day be settled. Mr. Armstrong has traveled often in this troubled area. He has kept friendly ties with leaders of both sides of the conflict, such as King Hussein of Jordan, President Suleiman Franger of Lebanon, Prime Minister Hedi Nouira of Tunisia, and Prime Ministers Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, and Menachem Begin of Israel. Focal point of the Middle East's troubles is Jerusalem, holy city for three of the world's great religions, and center of contention in the long struggle between the Arab and Israeli people. Mr. Armstrong travels frequently to this pivotal city. Well, I think I've met every prime minister of Israel since 1968 and every president. Well, I'm sure that all of them, including myself, appreciate very much oh, what I'm you sure. are doing for this city, all the new to excavate, to participate, and God bless you. How do you foresee conditions here in the Middle East now, in the immediate future? 
I think we have a chance to break through the wall of belligerency. It's a very complicated business, but after a very long interval, there is a chance, and I think it is for us responsible people not to miss it, not to miss it. Do you think that... Uh, Mr. Armstrong discussed the problems that the Middle Eastern leaders face in their quest for peace, including the role of Israel's close neighbor, King Hussein of Jordan. I think the king knows where he wants to arrive, but he didn't find that a way to do so. I know he would like to have peace with yes, you. I think so. Yes. Uh... I uh, think last time I saw him was two years ago. And Mr. Begin was prime minister. I said to King Hussein, I would like to bring Mr. Begin over here in my airplane and have you come out to the plane and my crew and myself and all of us would leave and leave you two on the plane <laughs> and get acquainted. I know Mr. Begin well enough. I believe he would be glad to do it. Yes. And I know you would too, Your Majesty, if. And he began to laugh and he says, yes, you're right, I would, if. But he, he would like to, if he could. I think so. I think that he has his eyes set on peace, but he has to negotiate mm -hmm. many difficulties. I hope you have the breakthrough that you spoke of. We shall try very hard. Thank you very much. We owe it to our friends and to our posterity. We owe it. We shall try very hard. Well, I can tell you this much. We're going to have more troubles all over the world. In the end, we're going to have world peace. Mm -hmm. It isn't going to come right away, though. Yes. And it isn't going to come easy. Jerusalem is a city that has rarely known peace. Human passion and religious fervor ensure that prophecy must take its inevitable course. And in the hills and valleys that surround Jerusalem, civilization will be brought to its knees. But God's work can focus on the future when Jerusalem will be the center for worldwide peace and cooperation. Through the Ambassador Foundation, Mr. Armstrong has worked with Jerusalem's leaders to provide centers where Jewish and Arab children can learn to live, play, and work in peace. It is a significant effort, showing in a practical way that peace can never come until a generation of children have been prepared for a way of life other than war. Mr. Armstrong worked with Mayor Teddy Collock in supporting the children's playground in Liberty Bell Park that was established during America's bicentennial. In recognition of his contribution to the welfare of the city's people, Mayor Teddy Collock presented Mr. Armstrong with a token of appreciation. Yeah. Well, President Armstrong, all your life you have been a fighter of giant lies and of giant uh, untruth. And as you regard yourself a descendant of David, and rightly so, here in the city of David, we would like to present you with this symbolic sculpture in silver and gold of David with his slingshot defeating Goliath. The stories of the Bible are better known to you than to anybody around this table. But here, 
it assumes particular symbolism and particular content. And Mr. Ravid reminded us of the children storming you and appraising you for what you did there, or if it's a very recent contemporary history of helping ICCY uh, with their daily programs. And I'm sure you'll continue with many of these things, but here we are mainly to thank you and proffer you this uh, symbolic gift, which says it all just by looking at it. Thank you very much. Mr. Armstrong then reminded his hosts of the key role that Jerusalem plays in world events, now and in the future. Jerusalem is a city with a very remarkable history, more than almost any other city. The eternal God himself says that this city is destined to become the greatest city in the world and, in fact, in the whole universe. This city is someday going to be the capital of the universe because this city is going to exist forever. It may still undergo some more changes, but it's going to endure. <coughs> and you can't say that of any other city on Earth. Christ's apostles first preached the gospel to the people of Jerusalem nearly 2,000 years ago. Those first apostles traveled thousands of miles on foot, on horseback, and by sailing boat, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God throughout the Roman Empire. Today, the message is the same, but the end-time work has a means of transportation that makes it possible to travel more miles in one day than a lifetime of voyaging in the first century. The first airplane to be used by Mr. Armstrong was a Falcon fan jet. This was replaced by the larger and longer range Gulfstream II. The G2 served the work faithfully for 14 years, logging more than 3 million miles. In 1983, it was decided to replace the G2 with the similar but greatly improved Gulfstream III. The G3 was built at the Gulfstream Aerospace Assembly Plant in Savannah, Georgia. frame has been assembled, the thousands of parts that make up a modern jet aircraft are carefully installed. The aircraft systems are thoroughly tested before it leaves the production line. Okay, start your dry crank. Uh, right engine motoring over, combine flight utility coming up. Roger, select manning gear up, the manning gear up and locked, sir, hydraulic reading. As follows, combine 3,000 pound utility zero, flight 1,500. Gear up, system greed as noted, ready to proceed. Aileron, rudder, elevator, operated while applying wheel brakes, ground spoilers, and thrust reversers. He's slow now. With all systems functioning, the moment comes for the rollout.
there are still many more hours of engine and flight tests to be completed. But eventually, it is time to add the finishing touches. In the paint shop, the distinctive Ambassador College color scheme is carefully applied. Meanwhile, in the cabinet shops, the interior fittings are being built. As the interior begins to take shape, Mr. Armstrong visits Savannah to personally inspect the progress on his new office in the sky. Everything must reflect the high standard that people around the world associate with Ambassador College and the work. The G3 can fly at 85% of the speed of sound, about 637 miles per hour. It can travel non-stop for 4,370 miles at an altitude of 40,000 feet. Cabin pressure is maintained at a comfortable 6,000 feet. With its advanced design and sophisticated equipment, the G3 is considered to be the finest medium-sized jet passenger plane in the world. August 19, 1985, the new G3 was flown to the airstrip at the Ambassador College campus in Big Sandy to be delivered to Mr. Armstrong. Looks just like the G2. This is Triple One Alpha Charlie. Delivery of the G3 Triple One Alpha Charlie. Yes, sir. Already is all yours. powerful new tool began its years of service to the work of God. base for the G3 is Burbank Airport, 15 miles from Pasadena. 
the ground crew prepares it for an extended trip to South Asia and the Far East. Baggage and food are loaded aboard and final preparations are made. After Mr. Armstrong and those traveling with him arrive, Captain Ken Hopke and co-captain Larry Dietrich make a final pre-flight check. Autopilot, track two, track two. Check. Hey, APU, is, uh, for the clearance belt three, triple one off. Charlie is ready for ATC clearance. November triple one off for Charlie. You're cleared to the Honolulu Airport via the Canoga 5 departure. Fillmore transition. To fill more, then flight plan route. Maintain 7,000. Expect flight level 39er within five minutes after departure. Departure control frequency 124.6, squawk 0385. Hey, ready for taxi. Clear right. Clear right. Clear right. Okay. The G3 takes off from Burbank and heads out across the Pacific Ocean. Mr. Armstrong uses the many long hours of flying to catch up on essential writing. I visit many heads of state all over the world. I probably have visited more heads of government in their own offices than any other man. And so often people ask me, well, what do I talk about? Do I preach Christ to them? Do I try to get them to accept Christ? I think it's about time we understand. If I went in with some message like that, will you give your heart to the Lord? I would be thrown out on my ear. In other nations, in foreign nations, where they have different religions, they don't want some other religion coming in. I have to use a little more wisdom. What do I talk about? I talk about the conditions that they're confronted with. I talk about world conditions and problems, problems that are far greater than they themselves are able to cope with. I talk about the cause of these conditions. I go as an ambassador, an unofficial ambassador for world peace, and they receive me as an ambassador for world peace. But I have to tell them why we don't have peace. I have to show them how peace is going to come and why we don't have it. Now, actually, the cause is the violation of God's law. Do I talk to them about God's law? Do I talk to them about sin? Of course I do, but I don't use those terms. I don't talk as a religious man. So I talk to them in language they understand. And so I talk about giving and about loving and being concerned for the welfare of others as well as yourself. And this world is built on the philosophy of get. Everyone wants to get for himself. And that's what's causing all of the troubles in the world. And you know, that makes sense to heads of state. They're practical men. They say these things about them all the time. And they begin to listen when I talk about those things. Do I talk about the kingdom of God? Yes, I do. And God is going to intervene. And sometimes I tell them that straight out. So many of them get the message and they do understand.
After many hours of flying, the pilots prepare to land in Beijing, capital of the People's Republic of China. Beijing Tower, November 111, Alpha Charlie, landing Beijing. November 111, Alpha Charlie. You are clear to land runway 36, surface wind 350 and 10. Roger, clear to land, 11 Alpha Charlie. Mr. Armstrong was met by an official delegation from the Sung Ching Ling Foundation and the Chinese People's Association for Friendship with Foreign Countries. Later that day, at a reception, Mr. Armstrong was welcomed by Madame Kang Kijing, who is considered to be China's first lady. A key event in Mr. Armstrong's six-day visit was a meeting with China's most prominent leader, Deng Xiaoping, in the Great Hall of the People. China is undertaking a sweeping modernization program. Great progress has been made in this huge country in the last 35 years, but China still has a long way to go in achieving success and prosperity for her vast population. Deng Xiaoping has been frank in admitting that mistakes have been made. And under his leadership, China is making important changes as they prepare for the last decade of the 20th century and beyond. Mr. Armstrong was also frank in telling his Chinese hosts the root cause of humanity's problems and the ultimate change in direction that must be made before any nation can have lasting peace. I would just like to say that we are living in a world of contrast, a world of awesome progress, advancement in technology, in engineering, in production of every kind. And yet, at the same time, a world that is filled with evils, and the evils are multiplying more rapidly than the progress. Why do we live in such a world? Why cannot we solve all of the problems? Why cannot we have world peace? I can answer in just two words, human nature. Human nature always seeks to get and to take, but has no concern for the good of others. If we're going to have real world peace, we will have to overcome that tendency of human nature. An important contribution towards peace is to teach tomorrow's leaders the way of cooperation and service. China has hundreds of millions of children. As chairman of the Ambassador Foundation, Mr. Armstrong has established a working relationship with Chinese organizations dedicated to serving youth. Several months before Mr. Armstrong's visit to China, the Ambassador Foundation sponsored children from the Children's Palace in Shanghai on a tour of several American cities. They had stayed on the Ambassador campus 
and visited with Mr. Armstrong at his home. During his trip to China, Mr. Armstrong visited the Shanghai Children's Palace, where talented children are taught a variety of cultural skills. The reunion with his Chinese grandchildren was a highlight of a busy week. At a banquet in Shanghai's Jin Jiang Club, Mr. Armstrong delivered a parting address. The world is now threatened with nuclear war, and all of the experts admit that if a nuclear war starts, it can never be stopped. Now, the world is and if a nuclear war is not stopped, it would erase all human, human beings off this earth. An important business magazine in the United States carried an editorial which said it would seem that the only hope of humanity now lies in the sudden appearance and intervention of a strong hand from someplace. The editor who wrote that was referring to the creator God who created all mankind. And I tell you tonight, by his authority, that he will intervene and will save humanity and we will have world peace. 我今天晚上想告诉你们只有上帝的权威才能加以干预才能给世界带来和平。but when the great creator does intervene and rule all nations on the earth, he is going to begin teaching us peace by working with the little children. After leaving China, Mr. Armstrong and his party traveled on to several other Asian countries. He was also invited to visit the leaders of the beautiful but troubled island of Sri Lanka, located in the Indian Ocean off the southern tip of India. Sri Lanka should be a blessed land. With its small population and abundant resources, the nation has been able to avoid some of the problems that other nations in this poverty-stricken region must struggle against. Sri Lanka has embarked on an ambitious development scheme to harness the waters of the nation's largest river and open up thousands of acres of arid land for settlement and cultivation. Mr. Armstrong was asked by the Sri Lankans to view this vast project now in the final stages of completion. Sri Lanka is the only developing... Later, he discussed Sri Lanka's development with President Junius Jayawardena. I want to see that. They're going to get 
president explained that in spite of spectacular progress, Sri Lanka is going through a time of trouble. Separatists, seeking their own state in the north, have engaged in several acts of terrorism. Hundreds have been killed and wounded, and the calm of this tropical island paradise has been shattered. The Sri Lankans have learned that material development of itself does not bring peace. Man can find a way to control the power of mighty rivers, but he cannot stop the tide of anger, resentment, and contention that flows from human hearts. In a lively press conference with Sri Lankan radio, TV, and newspaper reporters, Mr. Armstrong explained why the nation could not find peace. Well, all our problems are caused by human nature. And human nature is essentially selfish. Now, I can explain those things. I can say that uh, it comes from self-interest, from the spirit of competition, always from the point of view of the interest of oneself or one's party or one's race or one's religion or whatever one is a member of. But we're living in a competitive world. We're living in a world that is based fundamentally on the philosophy of get. And so we still do not have peace because people do not know the way to peace. The way to peace is having concern for your fellow man. The way to peace is love. The way to peace is cooperation and helping one another and having a loving concern for the good of other people. And that gets into human nature. Now, I cannot change human nature. I can talk about it, and I can explain, and I can give the reason. But every one of you must make up your own mind what you're going to do. I can't make up your mind for you. And that's the same with everybody else on Earth. I can't make up the minds of other people. I can only make up my mind what I want to do. But I can't explain the truth and the cause of wars and the way to world peace. And it will not come until mankind comes to have love for his neighbor. And today, man doesn't love his neighbor. Nation doesn't love other nations. They love their own nation. And so we have competition, and that leads to, often, to war. And individuals come to what you're having here right now, uh, the kind of violence has come into terrorism. And terrorism comes in the same way as war, from a wrong attitude of mind, a wrong desire of just selfishness, and of opposition toward other people and wanting to use force of some kind to have your own way against other people. I cannot, I don't have a magic wand. I can't wave a magic wand and, and just say the world has peace. You can't, can't bring it about that way. I have to look at the facts as they are. And the facts are human nature. But I feel what you have just said is only philosophy and does not offer any solution to our problem. How will that produce peace now? It won't produce peace now. I'm just telling you the facts that what will produce peace. And I say to you that we human beings are not going to produce peace. I think that all religions, at least, know that there is a higher power. Many of them don't know what that higher power is. They don't have it defined, perhaps, because they don't know. But there is a higher power, and that higher power is going to have to come and bring us peace. We're not going to bring peace. But the great creator, God, is going to have to intervene and bring us peace if he has to force it upon us. 
And that's the way peace is finally going to come. As for Sri Lanka, we have prayed to God to solve our ethnic problem. But I don't think even God can promote peace in this country. I say to you that God could intervene right now. But that is not his will to do that, and he is not, I can tell you that, he is not going to intervene right now. He's going to let us learn some lessons. Human beings do not know that they should love their fellow man. And so we go about loving our own selves instead of our fellow man. And God is going to let us punish ourselves and bring about wars and kill so many people. It will come to the place where we would destroy every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth. The weapons of mass destruction now exist. The United States has them. The Soviet Union has them. France has them. China has them. Other nations are beginning to have nuclear weapons. And a nuclear war could erase all human life from this earth. And conditions are going to come, and men are going to go on fighting one another, and men are going to go on. I can't change their minds, and no other man can change their minds. And men are going to have to learn that lesson. They're going to come to the place where they would destroy the last man and woman and child on earth. Then the Supreme God is going to intervene before that happens. And he is not going to intervene until that, until we learn our lesson. Humanity won't learn. I can tell you the way to peace, but you won't believe me. You men right here won't believe me. The world won't believe me. And I can't bring peace unless you would believe me, and you won't. I'm speaking very plainly. I represent that higher power. And I know what he proposes. And I know what he is going to do. And he won't do it until we have punished ourselves to the place where we're willing to submit to him. The trouble is, neither side in this problem that you're having here right now is willing to submit to that higher power. And as long as you want, you're going to fight and have trouble. And we're going to have to come to the place where we have to rely on him to do it for us. In Colombo, the capital city, Mr. Armstrong explained the purpose of the Ambassador Foundation to Sri Lankan Prime Minister Ranasinghe Premadasa. I'm sure you understand that the Ambassador Foundation yes, is I not do. religious. I do. It's neither political nor religious. It's, it's separate. It is supported by the church. Yeah. But uh, it is not religious in itself at all. And even the church is not proselyting and is not seeking members. And so we have nothing to gain. Uh, but perhaps we may have something to give. Right. right. And the more you give, you gain. That's right. Well, as has been said, it's more blessed to give than re to receive. That is so. And I find that is, is actually true. If you endeavor to gain, you won't get anything. I think that's the basis of the trouble in the world. Right. The people in the world are all trying to gain and to get. Indeed. And not to share or to give. But sharing and giving is by far better. That's right. And will lead to peace instead of troubles. If people had more concern for others than themselves, and we weren't competitive, but we were cooperative and helpful to one another, we'd have peace. We are very thankful to you for taking time off to visit our country and discuss matters with us and for the great service you are rendering 
to mankind. After leaving Sri Lanka, the G3 flew across the Bay of Bengal to Thailand. Mr. Armstrong has enjoyed a warm friendship with Thailand's hard-working King Pumipon and Queen Sirikan. He has been impressed with their outstanding example of service to their people. Since 1971, the Ambassador Foundation has aided their majesties in projects to encourage the hill tribes to replace the opium poppy with a more profitable and less destructive cash crop. In a visit to Thailand in 1984, Mr. Armstrong was invited by Queen Sirikit to fly with her in the royal helicopter to a remote hill tribe settlement close to the border between Thailand and Burma. Queen showed Mr. Armstrong the progress that had been made in helping these backward people develop a more settled and prosperous standard of living. Knowing Her Majesty's dedication to helping Thailand's poor while preserving their heritage, Mr. Armstrong assisted her in promoting a greater knowledge of fine quality Thai handicrafts. The Ambassador Television Studios produced an hour-long documentary which told the story of King Pumipon and Queen Sirikat's total dedication to their people. Mr. Armstrong personally presented their majesties with this videotape production. The royal family has honored Mr. Armstrong several times, decorating him in recognition of his long friendship and service to the Thai nation. Thank you, Your Majesty. A highlight in the long and productive relationship came in March 1985, when Her Majesty accepted Mr. Armstrong's invitation to visit Ambassador College for several days. Mr. Armstrong escorted the Queen on a personal tour of the college's beautiful Pasadena campus. Queen Sirikit also attended a number of banquets and receptions in her honor. Present were many state and local dignitaries. So I think Mr. Armstrong and my husband have the same goal, the common goal, that is the harmony, the, the world harmony, and better understanding between people in all over the world. In conjunction with her visit, the largest display of ancient and modern Thai treasures ever exhibited outside of Thailand was showcased in the lobby of the Hall of Administration. Later, on the stage of the Ambassador Auditorium, 
Mr. Armstrong introduced Queen Chiricot to an audience of distinguished businessmen and leaders of the local community. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this afternoon. And before I introduce Her Majesty, the Queen of Thailand, I'd like to say a few things about the royal family of Thailand. Their Majesties, the King and Queen of Thailand, have devoted their lives to the welfare of their people, to serving them. They go out among them personally. I spent one day with Her Majesty, the Queen, among one of their nomad tribes in the north. And their majesties are interested in going up and working with them. So now it's my very great pleasure to introduce a very dear and affectionate friend, Her Majesty Queen Siricut of Thailand. very happy today to visit the home base of Mr. Armstrong, a gentleman whom I consider to be my true personal friend as well as the friend of all men of goodwill in this world. Because of his wisdom, far-sightedness, and humanitarian heart, he knows it is meaningless to talk about security, democracy, and international cooperation when a large number of people still hardly have enough to keep body and soul together. I know that his financial aid to various projects has been extremely generous, but I think that he is most appreciated because of the spiritual impact he makes. To those who meet him, he is the symbol of the warm-hearted citizen of the advanced countries who is willing to understand, give encouragement, and lend a helping hand when needed. If the people of the world are ever to reach their full potential, it is important that the educated in all nations learn to cooperate and serve those less fortunate than themselves. The United Nations has been the most successful instrument for international cooperation so far. In the closing days of World War II, representatives of 51 nations met in San Francisco to lay the foundations of an organization that they hoped would once and for all provide a forum where nations could work out their differences at the conference table rather than on the battlefield. It is in many ways the most effective vehicle that man has ever devised to improve communication between nations. But in spite of dedicated and sincere effort, the United Nations has been unable to keep the peace. In June 1985, representatives of the world's nations gathered once again in San Francisco to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the United Nations. Delegates reviewed 40 years of achievement and considered the future of the world organization. Mr. Armstrong had reported the 1945 conference for the plain truth. 
Today, he has met with more heads of state and leaders of government than any other man alive. He was afforded a position of honor during the days of discussion and debate. If you asked me, what does the United Nations need most? More power or more money or both? My answer would be, the United Nations needs above all the love, the understanding, the interest, and the support of the peoples of all nations. The hardest thing for human beings to do is to set lofty goals and work hard for them while recognizing that they may never be fully realized. Yet this is what the United Nations is really all about. The failure of the United Nations to meet all its lofty aims is no cause for despair. We should continue to set high goals that inspire us to work harder and to persevere. It is said, according to United Nations studies, that we've had 154 conventional wars since 1945, fought on 71 countries, on the ground of 71 countries, with over 20 million people dead. It continues, even at this moment in time, at a measured loss of life of 1,000 people a day, 30,000 a month, ad infinitum. What would we do without the United Nations Forum on Arms Control and Disarmament? It is entirely possible that without it, the doomsday clock would already have struck midnight. Perhaps we can meet here again in San Francisco, 40 years from now, in the year 2025. And in the interim, because of the tireless work which is done, sanity may have intervened. And we will then be at a conference discussing a convention on the control of the proliferation of plowshares and pruning hooks. As one who has devotedly sat on the sidelines of the Security Council for nearly 40, 40 years, perhaps I may be forgiven for saying that there are moments, or have been moments and still are, when I feel that only an invasion from outer space is likely to reintroduce to the Security Council that spirit of unanimity and collegiate responsibility which the authors of the Charter were talking about. I sincerely hope I may be proved to be wrong. Only three of the original signers of the United Nations Charter are alive today. They were invited to attend the commemoration conference and speak to the delegates. We who came together in those early days of the UN know that the most and certainly the best we could do at that time was to build the foundation. We can pride ourselves that the foundation is still intact. But the structure of a genuine peace has yet to be built. This is the continuing challenge for all those who understand that the human race cannot survive in a condition of world anarchy. It's not enough for the young generation to say we do not want a nuclear war. That's obvious. But if there is to be peacekeeping, there must be peacemaking. And the United Nations needs a tremendous expansion in the way in which solutions are worked out and brought forward. When we look ahead to the years of peace, we find that distressingly little is being contemplated to be done in this conference in the realm of the mind and spirit. It is to the spirit and mind of man, to his ideas and his attitudes, that we must devote considerable attention if the peace is going to be truly won. Unless we secure the right conditions for spiritual and intellectual health and unless we determine the right positive ideas for which man should live, I am afraid all our work in this conference may prove to have been in vain. Have this 
particular... Hesitation. After his speech, Dr. Malik privately discussed with Mr. Armstrong what he considered to be the missing dimension in the philosophy of the United Nations representative. There is an old wisdom in the Middle East with which we are fully acquainted. You know, history began in the Middle East. I mean, the history of the Western world began in the Middle East, in Mesopotamia, in Egypt, on the shores of Lebanon, the Phoenicians, then in Jerusalem, and so forth. Uh, one of the basic things that you find everybody believes in, everybody without exception, in every village in Lebanon, in every village in Egypt, everywhere. One of the fundamental things which nobody talks about here, because now you have, uh, with all respect for you, now you have outgrown this uh, old wisdom of the Middle East. One of the important things that we talk about is the devil. I'd like to see one man speak of the devil. Mm -hmm. Now, the devil has penetrated human heart everywhere. In your heart, sir, and in mine, the devil is, is contending with, with Christ all the time. He's contending with him in all sorts of ways. I can uh, reveal them to you at length. So uh, we believe that the devil is at work in the midst of all these events. And while the devil is at work and has not yet been completely conquered, vanquished, uh, we will never have peace. We will never have peace. You think the United Nations is going to bring about peace so long as the devil is around? We had a thousand people today at lunch, more than a thousand, maybe 1,500. I was sitting down and thinking all the time, Mr. Armstrong, all the time, what is going on in the minds of these people? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure the devil was not there in the minds of these people. I'm not sure at all. Yeah. With all uh, their schemes and ideas and uh, uh, emotions and uh, uh, aspirations and plannings and uh, all kinds of things. The devil is at work. So this is a thing that if you ask anybody, any peasant in Lebanon or in Egypt will tell you, of course the devil is at work. But here, the devil has so much conquered you that you don't talk about him. You wouldn't dare talk about him. I didn't say conquered you. Uh, this is the wrong way of putting it. But he, he is so clever that one way with which he acts is to conceal himself. Today, few people realize that this is Satan's world. As Satan's rule of this earth draws nearer to the end, it becomes increasingly important for an ambassador of the kingdom of God to reach many nations with the warning of tribulation and the promise of peace. There is a special urgency in reaching the nations of the industrial world, for the prophecies show that it is these nations that will trigger the crisis that catapults the human race into the final trial. Since the end of the Second World War, Europe has known 40 years of peace one of the longest periods without war in this continent's stormy history. After the destruction of the war, the nations have rebuilt. Behind the scenes, patient, cautious men have been working for future prosperity and the fulfillment of an old dream, a United States of Europe. Because of Europe's critical role in the fulfillment of prophecy, Mr. Armstrong has kept in contact with these architects of a united Europe. Such a man is Dr. Otto von Habsburg, son of the last Austrian emperor and a leading member of the European Parliament. Dr. von Habsburg, yes. I wonder if you can bring me up to date a little bit on the progress of the uh, unif unification Thank project you, here in Europe. I will tell you, uh, we have, of course, made a major breakthrough with the uh, enlargement. Uh, with the accession of Spain and Portugal, this was a major breakthrough. You see, uh, I have a little bit directly to do with it since I'm the first vice president 
of the mixed committee between the European Parliament and the Spanish Cortes. Mm -hmm. So I was in the negotiation. When Europe starts uniting, which will be the strongest body, the European Parliament or the East? What, what will be the strongest? I hope it will be balanced. I think there is a fair chance of it being balanced. You see, I wouldn't be happy about any of the powers being too strong. They should all be uh, checking each other, because if a power runs away with too much of influence, uh, it's always dangerous. You know, it's, it's like in a state, it's the same thing. The checks and balances are something very important to keep freedom. Leaders like Dr. Van Opsburg plan for a united Europe that will be a powerful force for peace and democracy in the world. The birthplace of European democracy was ancient Greece. The Apostle Paul once proclaimed the true gospel to the superstitious inhabitants of Athens. Two thousand years later, Mr. Armstrong confronted political leaders and businessmen in the Athens Rotary Club with the truth about the future of Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It certainly is a great honor to be able to speak to the Rotary Club here in Athens, Greece, one of the most ancient cities in the world and the home of education, scholarship, and culture, uh, one of the oldest cultural cities in the world. I come to you as an unofficial ambassador for peace. Armies do not bring peace to a country. We have not learned the way to peace. Yesterday, I was having a meeting with some of the officials of your country, and there was considerable discussion about the plans for the unification of Europe. And uh, as one of your officials said, World peace depends upon European unification. I want to tell you something more about the coming unification of Europe. We not only have language barriers between the nations and nationalism, different aspirations, and all that sort of thing and differences which have to be overcome, but many of the political leaders feel that they do not want to be church dominated, and yet they're not going to be able to get together without the cohesiveness of church domination and the church bringing them all together. You see, now even the church is divided between East and West. I can tell you, however, that I fully believe that that, is, that rift is going to be healed. And I fully believe that unification will be unexpectedly and suddenly achieved, and the whole world is going to be stunned and astounded when it is announced that there is, in the continent of Europe, a new political unification, a nation as great or greater than the Soviet Union or the United States of America. Many listen respectfully, but they do not believe. The old nations of Europe are tired of war. They seek unification only for peaceful purposes. It is a bold dream, but the prophecies show that the union of the nations in Europe will result not in peace, but in the most terrible instrument of destruction the world has ever seen. The course of a united Europe was charted long ago in the days of the prophet Daniel, when the destiny of this world passed into the hands of four world-ruling empires. Daniel had seen four beasts representing those empires. 
then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast. Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. The ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from this kingdom. And so God revealed that the fourth beast represented the fourth empire, which would continue in one form or another to the time of the end. Babylon fell to the Persian Empire in the 6th century BC. The Persians ruled the world for two centuries until 333 BC when the armies of Alexander destroyed Persia's power. This third empire, like unto a leopard, endured for nearly three more centuries before falling to the might of the Romans. And so, in 31 BC, the fourth beast was born as an empire, a power that would influence the affairs of the world until the second coming of Jesus Christ rescues mankind from its clutches. It was in the heyday of the first stage of the Roman Empire that Jesus Christ revealed the final details of its role in world history. On the Mediterranean island of Patmos, the elderly apostle John received the visions recorded in the Apocalypse or Book of Revelation. He saw in vivid detail a cataclysmic war that would take place at the end of the age. Against this backdrop of mayhem and destruction, John saw once again the savage beast of Daniel's vision, now combined into one all-consuming monster. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? Here, then, is a beast of fearsome proportion, the majesty of Babylon, the relentless force of Persia, the speed of the four-headed leopard of Greece, all combined to produce the formidable military might of the Romans. The ten horns represent ten governments to be formed from this beast for it would arise again and again, casting its terrible shadow across nearly 1,600 years of history. The old Roman Empire fell in A.D. 476. Three kingdoms supplanted it, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths. Then the Emperor Justinian restored the power of Imperial Rome in A.D. 554 as symbolized by the fourth horn of the beast. In A.D. 800, Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope on Christmas Day as a successor to the throne of Rome. In 962, the sixth horn became known as the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, when Pope John XII crowned Otto the Great. Then, in 1530, the Habsburg dynasty reached the apex of its power when the Pope crowned Charles V as the Holy Roman Emperor. This dynastic seventh horn lasted until it was overthrown by Napoleon, who, seizing the crown from the hands of the Pope, crowned himself Emperor. Napoleon's short reign ended in 1814, 
a date recognized in history as the end of a government that lasted 1260 years from the restoration of the Roman Empire in the West by Justinian. But the beast was not dead. By 1870, Garibaldi's efforts led to a united Italy, thus beginning a chain of events that resulted in the formation of the ninth government to arise out of the Roman Empire. In 1923, the fascists under Mussolini had already come to power in Rome. Meanwhile, an attempt by the Nazi party to take over the German government was thwarted. But, ten years later, Hitler did rise to power, and his Third Reich was soon to lunge out at Europe and hold it captive for five nightmare years. Hitler drew inspiration from ancient Rome. Even his architecture was inspired by the styles of the Caesar. Before this ninth fearsome horn of the Roman Empire had been crushed in the ruins of fascism and the Third Reich, much of Europe had been reduced to rubble. Forty years later, there is little left to remind the visitors of the ravages of war. The place where Hitler once goaded his people into frenzy is now a park where old people stroll and children play. Close by, the review stand at Zeppelin Field, where the legions of the Third Reich paraded before their Fuhrer, is now in ruins. But it is not the end. The terrible beast must appear once more for a final rampage of destruction. The prophecies show that ten nations or group of nations in Europe will join their economic, military, and political forces. It will be a fragile union, iron mixed with miry clay. But old rivalries and quarrels will be suspended for a time, held together by a common need and a common faith. These nations will become a third superpower. It may at first seem to be a peaceful union, but the Bible reveals the true nature that lies beneath the surface. Goaded into action, the beast will wreak havoc on the earth. The armies of the beast will lash out, laying waste the modern-day descendants of the ancient house of Israel. Then the beast turns in its rage on the nations of the East. Finally, powerful armies gather to fight a climactic battle for Jerusalem. So great is the fury, so awful the weapons, that humanity peters on the brink of destroying all flesh, man and animals alike, from off the earth. Only the intervention of God can save humanity. And God does intervene. Jesus Christ returns to earth in power and glory, stopping the fighting, subduing the adversaries, rescuing his chosen people from cruel tribulation. Then this world, this civilization, that has known so much misery and destruction, will be over. Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom on the earth, which will lead the world into a thousand years of peace. Leaders of nations will come to this kingdom 
eager to be taught the way that leads to peace. They will come to a tranquil land, developing in happiness and prosperity, living in harmony with God and His laws. Many then will remember that in the last days of that past civilization, an ambassador of this kingdom came to them with the advanced news of a peaceful world tomorrow. And I'm here to announce to you tonight that God is going to let this world come crashing down, but it's going to be replaced with a far better world that will be filled with love and with peace and joy and happiness and with greater production by far than anything we've dreamed of having yet, and where everybody will be well educated and rightly and properly educated. I feel the responsibility, and a voice has to cry out in this wilderness of religious confusion, this wilderness of a Babylon of ideas, and everybody having different ideas, and everybody against everybody else. Someone has to cry out with that message and announce what is going to happen as certain as the sun is going to rise and set tomorrow. Now, I know you haven't heard anything said like this before, but I have been sent here by that eternal living Creator God, the God over all races and all people and all nations, to tell you the truth which missionaries have failed to tell you, which religions have not known and have not been able to tell you, which the colleges and universities do not teach, which science doesn't even understand. But you have been told tonight.